Good morning. We'd like to welcome you to this edition of Face to Face, uh, our uh, periodic hangouts with members of the industry, in this case, of the sports industry. We'd like to welcome Greg Rebell, the sports anchor and voice of the BYU Cougars. How are you this morning, Greg? I'm very well. Thanks for having me. Great, great, great to have you here. Well, <clears throat> excuse me, why don't we uh, start very, very simple. Tell us what you're doing and how you got there, and we'll roll from there. All right. Uh, uh, my current title is um, right. Director of BYU Sports Programming for KSL Radio. Uh, but, you know, I guess I'm, I'm more commonly known, as you said, as the, uh, as the voice of the Cougars. That is, I do the radio play-by-play -play, uh, for the BYU football and basketball games on KSL Radio, our network affiliates, and uh, BYU Radio, which is a satellite Sirius XM 143. So that's where the games are heard. Um, so uh, I, I call the play-by-play -play for those two sports. Uh, I host the radio and TV uh, coaches shows for both Bronco Mendenhall and Dave Rose, the, the football and basketball coaches at BYU. I have a blog on KSL.com that I started about uh, five and a half years ago called Cougar Tracks. Uh, that keeps me rather busy. What keeps me busiest, it seems, on a more consistent basis is uh, my Twitter feed. Uh, I got onto Twitter in uh, the summer of 2010 and uh, and and that's been uh, you know pretty much a constant you know source of, of uh, well it's, it's been a, it's been a constant journalistic platform for me uh, since I discovered it and, and really Twitter's been the biggest difference or biggest change um, in my professional life over the last couple three years um, I tweet a lot um, probably too much um, there, there, there could be some clinical treatment needed for me at some point. Um, but I average, if you were to break it down by day, I probably average anywhere from, you know, 25 to 30 tweets a day. That's every day for, you know, three years almost. And, and you know, there are certain days when you tweet more, certain days where you tweet less. But if you were to average it out, that would be about where it is because I'm at 26,000-something tweets. Um, followers is, has been a pretty good growth. You know, I'm sitting I'm – sitting, you know, over 13,000 followers right now, and that's something you hope to keep growing steadily as as more people get into Twitter. Uh, but that's a good number, I think, for this market and and for what I do. And so try and keep build that, obviously. But I find that I blog less nowadays and tweet a lot more because a lot of my tweets can serve as basically mini blogs if you if you want to look at it that way. Um, if they're you know if they're connected enough or sequential enough. Uh, they basically serve almost as kind of you know mini blogs, if you will. But uh, so Twitter keeps me very busy. Uh, but when you're in season, which is you know from August through March uh, or into April, as uh, as basketball played a little later this year, uh, it's just uh, you're constantly. It's a seven day a week job. Um, every Saturday is a game day. Every Sunday is a coach's show. Um, and then of course during the week you're you're prepping for the next game or games. And so. In those in those months, August to March or into April, it's just pretty much a, a you know a, kind of a 24/7 um, you know uh, top of mind type occupation for me. So uh, how I got started, uh, I was uh, at BYU back in the uh, late 80s when uh, KSL brought me as an intern. I interned with Chris Tunis in uh, KSL Radio Sports. The kids in the class probably don't know, but uh, Chris Tunis was kind of a sports talk pioneer in Utah and he passed away recently but uh, he, he got me involved by bringing me in as, as his first ever intern and then KSL hired me um, after my internship ended and, and they brought me in as a part-time weekend news anchor that went to a full-time overnight news anchor this is all on radio then I became a talk show producer and then a morning sports anchor and then a sports talk show host and kind of step by step the you know the occupations progress, and and somewhere in the midst of all that, um, I got on the BYU broadcast crew as the sideline reporter. I did that for nine years before I got the play-by-play -play gig for football, and then a few years before that, uh, I began doing play-by-play -play for basketball. So this I just finished my I don't know 16th or 17th season of basketball play-by-play, -play, and I'll be starting my 13th season, I believe, of football play-by-play. -play. Uh, in the fall, if all goes as planned. So that's kind of the brief outline of my career. I came from Canada. I grew up in Canada and uh, came down to Utah to go to BYU in 1984. So I went to B from BYU. I went to BYU from 84 to 86. 
uh, two-year mission for the LDS Church, 86 to 88, and then back at BYU in 89, and that's kind of where uh, things picked up from there. And I've only worked for one professional company, KSL, which is very unusual in my business. Usually you bounce around, move up, and, and I've just kind of been fortunate to be uh, at a great station early and a station that also, you know, did the BYU games, and so that's kind of been the hook for me, and so that's, uh, that's where I'm at. Was that uh, coming out of high school, was this the sports field and, and broadcasting, was that something you had in mind, or did you just kind of gravitate that way after you got into college? No, I, I had it in mind. I think in high school I, I was either going to be, I wanted to be an architect or a broadcaster, and uh, I just didn't have the gift um, with, with drafting, and, and I, I just didn't have it. So I, I kind of gravitated more toward broadcasting. My dad was the public address announcer for a hockey team in the town I lived in. And so um, he would take me to the press box, and I, I saw a lot of hockey games from press boxes as a, as a kid. His, his announcer booth was right adjacent to the working media and also adjacent to the organist. Back in the day, they'd have you know organs in the press boxes, and they'd play music. It was great. That's how you should enjoy sports with it. With an organ there, but uh, he um, so his his booth was adjacent to the uh, the working media. So I got a feel at a very early age for what it was like to be a member of the press, and also what it's like to speak into a microphone and have your voice heard uh, by lots of people. And my dad had a really good voice for that. I don't have his voice. I wish I did, but uh, he has a great voice for that. And so um, that kind of got me thinking about the whole notion of sports casting. And then I took an interest in it and toured radio stations and TV stations and. And I was uh, just a huge sports fan um, and a big trivia buff. I, I read tons of sports books. I, I, I just uh, um, consumed stats and trivia, and that was kind of a big thing for me. And so I just grew up loving that, you know, that, that side of things. And, you know, I, I, if, if there was a way to combine my love for sports and my love for talking in the same job, that would be a good thing to pursue. And so that's kind of what got me into uh, – into broadcasting. So when I got to BYU as a 17-year-old freshman, um, I just went right to the uh, to the KBYU news department and said, you know, put me to work kind of thing. I'll do anything. And that kind of got me going. What, um, is this a destination job for you? I mean, you're a young guy. Well, not so much anymore. Young-wise, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm 45. But uh, yeah, I, I, I don't have plans to bounce to the next job because I'm calling the games uh, for my team. You know, this is kind of what I'd like to do for a while if they'll let me do it. So um, the fellow who preceded me, Paul James, he did it for 35 years and, uh, and then he retired. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm not up to that territory yet, but, um, you know, I, I'd like to do it for as long as they'll let me um, and, and I'd be happy doing that. I, I like where I live. Um, again, I went to BYU, so calling games for BYU is a pretty cool deal if you ask me because I get to you know, call games for my school, if you will. Um, and so, yeah, as long as they keep me, I'd like to keep doing it, I think, and then we'll, uh, we'll see what the future brings. But for the time being, uh, very content. Um, and again, I, I'm unusual that way. Uh, normally in my business, you work for multiple stations and outlets and live in different cities. And I've just been fortunate, I think fortunate, to, to work for just one really good company because at least in Utah, you know, KSL is kind of a, you know, kind of a legacy station, kind of a gold standard station. And so I'm happy to be there. And and again, the whole connection to BYU is what makes it worthwhile. So that's kind of where I'm at. Now, now you're actually employed by KSL, right? Yeah, people. Some people might think that uh, that you know BYU is my employer, or there's a combination thereof. But but KSL is my employer, and KSL has an agreement with BYU to carry their games. So does BYU, not necessarily for you, but for anybody uh, affiliated with the station that does the work, is there a a tacit approval given to the person? Do they have influence over that uh, as far as who's there and what they're doing? It would be contextual. It's not, it's not, it's, it, it would be implicit, not, uh, not, not, not tacit. It's, it's, it's very, I mean, if BYU was unhappy or were unhappy about something, they, they, they'd let KSL know. Um, and sometime, you know, or, or if, if it's, you know, right, we, you know, if it's right at the very grassroots level, they could let me know. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, anything that's you know dealt with in, in in that way is always handled, you know, I guess like any relationship, um, you know, that's that's been long, you know, long standing and in good standing, and like it has been. Um, so yeah, there are very few, you know, I guess situations like those that arise too much. They pretty much trust me and my judgment, you know, when I'm on the air. 
in terms of um, both the people I choose to work with, you know, as broadcast partners, and and how we construct the broadcast. I mean, they get a lot of feedback, I'm sure, from fans. And as long as the feedback is positive, then that's then that's a good thing. One of the things you mentioned is you're a huge sports fan. Obviously, you know, the kids that are watching, they're in sports marketing classes. Most of them, the sports grabbed them more than the marketing part did. Mm -hmm. How do you walk the line without being a fan, getting in the way of being a professional? Well, I mean, first of all, I can, I mean, as I talk to you, I've got, you know, the, the big screen in my office up here is up on the Golf Channel. I'm, I'm tracking what's happening in the Masters as we're talking, you know. Well, not as we're talking, but it's up there, you know. <laughs> I'm fully focused on you guys, um, but uh, you know, so that's that. That's my thing. You know, I, like I'm a big, you know, golf. You know, when it comes comes time for a major, I'm I'm locked into the Masters, for example. I am a sports fan. I'm a, I'm a fan of of every sport, and and a lot of things can grab me that way. Now, when it comes to my job, meaning BYU football and BYU basketball, um, you know, people know. Most people know that listen to me. Uh, are aware of my allegiance. They're aware that I either you know that I went to BYU and that BYU is my school. And when I'm, let's face it, when your title is voice of the Cougars, um, you know they, they expect a certain attachment to the program there. Um, but that said, I, I think it's possible, and this is kind of my mantra: um, you can be both partisan and professional. Okay. Now, I, I, I guess in 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 the purest sense of the word. Yeah, I'm a BYU fan. And that's my team. That's my school. I'm, I'm I've a vested interest in the fortunes of those teams. Obviously, uh, I want them to win as many games as possible. So, in that, in that, in that, to that extent, I'm a fan, meaning I want them to win. But, but I'm also, you know, a professional broadcaster, and I believe it's possible to be partisan and professional. People can know which side you come down on, and you can still be a consummate pro uh, in the business and with the broadcast. Um, you can still prepare uh, as 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 long and as hard as as anyone would expect you to or want you to be to be ready to broadcast, and you can still be as as and when it comes down to it, kind of objective relative to the most important things uh, about the craft. You know that is, um, you can still respect the opposition. You can pay credit to the opponent's good plays. Um, you don't have to believe that every call made against you is a bad call. And you don't have to applaud every call made you as a made in, in your favor as a great call. You can still call a professional game and yet, um, you know, blow your lid a bit sometimes when you know a great play happens in the final minute of the most intense game of the season. I mean, people expect a certain level of excitement from you. I do get a, a kind of a common complaint I'll hear sometimes is that you know Greg gets too excited for the opposition, you know, which which I think is music to my ears. That's a good thing, you know. Um, people, I mean, I, I have pretty much a, a pretty good sense that, you know, when when BYU makes a great play, you're going to hear it in my voice, okay? There will be a certain level of excitement. I don't think anything the, the opponent does will ever match that same level, but yet a great play is a great play no matter who makes it. You know, an opponent touchdown or an opponent three-point shot can still get a rise out of me because of the nature of the play and the nature of the game. By the same token... You know, when, when Matthew Della Vadova hits a, a, a half-court shot to beat BYU, you know, it broke my heart, you know, and I, I was not pumped up at that point, you know. So, so fans are going to get, you know, all kind of, you know, all, all areas of the spectrum, but the bottom line is you can still be a pro. Um, there's the, uh, there's a phrase, um, Homer, you know, the, 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 someone's a Homer broadcaster, and I know what it means when they say that, but I, I think implicit in that is almost, um, you know, it, kind of a criticism, if you will, that a homer, um, you know, believes that the home team can do no wrong, and the homer is just so over the top that you never get both sides of the story. And and ideally, you know, if, if I'm to be considered a quote-unquote homer, and again, I hate that word, I hope that it's with the understanding that, yeah, he's a BYU guy, but he's still a pro, and he still, you know, takes the job seriously, and still gives the opponent credit, that kind of thing. Now, I'm, I've lost you. It looks like for a little bit here. It looks like your your video feed to me is flashing, and I don't hear you anymore. So we may, we may need to reconnect, or maybe you're okay on that end. Here, I thought I could. Thought I. Could. If you can still hear me, uh, your audio is cut out, and now oh, your yeah, video. No, okay. You I, I can hear you. I can hear you, but I can't see you right now. 
Okay, don't worry about. There's something going on with the video, so I'm gonna I'm gonna block it out from the broadcast. As long as you can hear me, we're good to go. Can you see me? Yes, you're good. Okay, yeah, I just can't see you anymore, but I can hear you. Okay, let's go with a typical day, a, a non-game day in a in a game day. Pick the season. Pick. Just give us an idea of what you go through. And in other words, how do you have room? How do you have time for 25 tweets on a busy day? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I guess really, I guess you know, it would really depend on the day. Um, you know, Sunday would be a day. Sunday is a day that um, you know, after a Saturday game, Sunday morning is filled with a lot of catch-up work from the night before. Um, a lot of catch-up stats. A lot of um, going to the internet to uh, check out the NCAA stats, which are updated on Sunday mornings. A lot of preparation for that afternoon's coaches show that we tape on TV. So, so Sunday is a really busy day for me, um, and and I'll get up early in the morning to make sure that I get all of my. I can see your video now again. Uh, I'll get up early in the morning on Sunday to get as much of my coaches show work done as possible, and that means. Um, writing scripts, I can do it remotely, I can do it from home. Uh, writing scripts, preparing graphics, preparing stats, all those things that are going to be used in the taping of the coach show that afternoon. Um, I'll go to church, I'll go right from church to KSL, and that's where we tape the coaches show Sunday afternoons and into the evening. So Sunday is a really busy day, busier than I'd like it to be during the season. Um, and most of it's in, entailed, uh, most of it entails prepping for the coaches show on TV that afternoon. Um, Monday, is it going to be a pretty stat-heavy day? That's when I start beginning game prep for the next week's opponent. Um, Monday is a morning where I compile a ton of stat work. I update all of my stat databases. I have a number of stat databases that I update game to game that are stats that have been tracked for most of them back to 1972 onward. Um, so I update all my stat databases. And in that, in that process, which is a three- to four- to five-hour process on a Monday morning, that's when I start pumping out tweets that are pulled from that work I've done. So as I'm finding interesting things out about the previous game, breaking down the stats and getting into it, that's when I'm feeding what I've learned out to my audience on Twitter. So Monday's a big numbers day that way. Um, Tuesday um, is often a radio coaches show day. Tuesday or Wednesday is a radio uh, coaches show day and off time of day to attend practice as well and see what the team is doing. Um, most practices are closed during the season to the regular media, but, uh, but, BYU, uh, but uh, BYU will allow me and my broadcast partner to watch a practice on, on kind of a preparation basis. We don't report what we see, but we're allowed to use what we see as background for the game, if you will. Um, and the radio coaches shows, uh, again, will happen either Tuesday or Wednesday. As that's going on, I'm, already, I'm constantly prepping for that weekend's game uh, meaning I'm creating my spotting boards uh, for both BYU and for the opponent. I'm reading the opponent's uh, newspaper accounts, um, official uh, game note releases. Um, all these kinds of things are happening you know, kind of throughout the week. Uh, and then once you get into Thursday and Friday, Friday will be a travel day if the game's out of town. Um, and Thursday is a day when you're finishing up your board work, um, your spotting board work, and you're starting to script your pregame. Uh, I script all of my pregame shows that I've done. I have a half hour. Well, our, our, our football pregame shows last two hours. Our basketball pregame shows last an hour. And the final half hour, uh, yes, BYU knows that I have to work on Sunday. It's, it's sad but true. It's a necessary evil. Uh, but um, uh, I script. Now, the last half hour before kickoff or before tip-off belongs to me and my broadcast partner. That's when I get to set up the game for the listeners. I script those pregame shows word for word, literally word for word. So I write those shows out. And so the, the process of writing that half hour show takes a number of hours as well. And, and again, I like to script it word for word. Even though I could ad lib a half hour very easily, um, I like to script it out knowing exactly where I'm going in the things I'm trying to get across to my listeners. And so my broadcast partner also knows where I'm going and he can prepare to add to the show as well. So to me, and this is kind of a long way to get to it, but to me, uh, writing is, is as big a part of my job as anything I do. People think, well, you're a broadcaster, you're a play-by-play -play guy, that's a talking job. Okay, but for me, it's a writing job. Uh, the blog I do is nothing but long-form writing. Uh, even the tweets, I mean, you can, you can be a good writer 
in 140 characters. In fact, sometimes it forces you to be a better writer when you're having to write more, more concisely. So, you know, and, and then the pregame shows that I write, that this, this is all, um, you know, it, it's all part of the craft of writing. And to me, it's as big a thing as anything else I do. And especially nowadays, you can't go into broadcasting today and expect to be just a TV guy or, or just a radio guy and not have to be a writer. Uh, I think to be a good broadcaster now, more than ever, because of how multi the multimedia world has gotten, you've got to be a strong writer. It makes you that much more useful um, and valuable to your company. And, and to me, we do so much writing now, not just broadcast writing, but actual long-form writing that you've got you've to have a feel for it. And, um, and so I love the writing part of it. And, and writing those pregame shows is, is the, kind of the, it's the cherry on top for me. It's the final thing I do that gets me really ready for the game. I feel like I'm ready to go. Has, um, you know, independence from a fan perspective changed a lot of things. How, how are you affected as a broadcaster by the opposition? I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm assuming you get a little more up when it's a Notre Dame game versus an Idaho State game. But how, how, is, how has independence had an effect on you and your profession? Uh, it, it's, it's more just in the, in the sense of novelty. I mean, there, there's, there's more novelty now. Uh, you're going to get certain opponents on a regular basis. Um, you know, your video is flashing, but if you can still hear me, you're fine. Yeah, we're good. I'm not okay. sure what's causing that. Um, you know, it's, it, it's novelty. I mean, again, you're going to expect to see certain teams regularly, but for the most part, you get to see a lot of different teams in different places. And so, uh, you know, for me, from, the, from, from just the play-by-play -play standpoint, one of the best things about independence is the ability to go and see uh, different places and, and take on different teams and expose kind of BYU to different audiences, if you will. And so that's kind of been the neatest thing for me. And, of course, you like it when, when the schedule is as challenging as possible. And I think in 2013, you know, BYU fans get their, their best ever schedule. Um, and, I, and I believe you can't have a special season without a special schedule. And that's what BYU has in 2013 and I think beyond as well. I don't know how long they're going to stay independent, uh, but as long as they do, uh, Tom Homo is putting together, I think, some really nice schedules. And you've got to balance it. You have to have – an occasional Idaho State for every, you know, for for, for for the kind of schedule they have in November this year, uh, but you know, as long as it's no more than one of those, uh, one of those a year, one or two of those a year, I think fans should be really happy. Um, so you know, independence. It's it, it, the one thing that's different is just the, uh, you know, you're not competing for a conference crown. You're hoping for kind of a technical entree into the BCS or the playoff. You're not really awarded one, which is hard. You've got to kind of fight your way in, and um, that's going to be hard. I, I think when when the new playoff comes, you know, you could see the SEC, you know, take, you know, three, four, five spots maybe in a really good year. It doesn't leave too much room, I don't think, for, for other teams. And so um, it'll be hard for a team like BYU as an independent to fight their way into that, to, into that equation. Uh, that 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 would be kind of tough. You you had mentioned earlier that the biggest change in your profession in the last couple of years, or at least your personal role in that profession, has been Twitter. Give us a little insight into social media in general, how it's changed, how it's changed sports. Well, um, I'll speak first of all from a consumer before I speak as a provider. Uh, I I don't watch TV news anymore. I mean, I I don't watch local TV news. That's that, that that's one way in which social media has changed my life, um, my, my cell phone, you know, with, with my Twitter feed on it, that's my news feed. Um, you know, Twitter has become how I find out what's going on in the world, whether it's news or sports. I've got news providers and I've got sports providers, and I, I have very little need to go to television. What I go to TV for now is live events, live sports events, I, I lost your audio. I can't have your. I don't hear your audio anymore. You're good. We're, we're good okay, to go. I hear you now. Um, I go to. I hope, hopefully, you can hear me through all of that. Could you hear me the whole time? Okay. Um, your audio is a little off and on. But what I go to TV for now is live sporting events and things like you know Masters coverage on the Golf Channel or all DVR Parks and Rec or whatever. You know, I, I go to TV for very certain specific things. But it's rarely, if ever, news, which I, I used to be a news hound. I used to watch the local news, the national news. That's where, you know, but now with social media, social media, Twitter has taken away the television for me. And so my, my, my needs for TV are much more specific now than they ever used to be. 
Um, so that's as a as as a consumer. That's how social. One of, that's that's one of the ways social media has changed. You know, my life now as as a provider. Um, what it's allowed me to do is is create, um, sustain, and and kind of feed a fan base. Uh, you, your followers become your core audience now, and so those you know those thirteen thousand two hundred whatever followers that's that that's my core audience. I can speak to them in a very um, focused way. Um, you know that that they, they know that I that I that I I favor. Uh, you know, stat-based analysis and things like that. They can go to me for that. Uh, they know they know I have certain access to the program. They know I can form certain opinions based on information others may not have. They come to me for a very specific reason, and I can feed that um, through social media. Now, I'm I'm more Twitter than Facebook. I have a Facebook account, uh, but it's basically a mirror of my Twitter feed. So there is a Cougar Tracks Facebook page. But essentially, it just takes every tweet I send and turns it into a Facebook posting. Now, I could get more into Facebook, but to this point, it just hasn't met my needs as much as Twitter does or has to this point. Again, I may get more into Facebook, but I'm still kind of feeling out the best way to work, the best way to use that. For me right now, Twitter's uh, the most immediate, the most concise way for me to get information out. But I, I, I find that social media, you know, is, is just, it's just kind of changed the way I think about my job. Um, and it's also allowed me to interact and be exposed to others in my profession, others in my industry, uh, which can also help create kind of an information network, if you will, across different sports and, uh, and, and boundaries. So that's kind of how I view it. What, uh, with, with high school courses or college preparation, uh, we've got, say we have a couple of students that are watching that uh, they want to be uh, in your chair someday. How would you recommend they prepare for that? Well, you know, I, I guess I took a somewhat typical path, if you will, um, you know, in elementary school and high school, uh, I, I took classes and courses that allowed me to um, kind of put myself out there, be used to speaking in public. I, I, I enrolled in public speaking contests. I was in drama. Uh, I was in choir. Um, I was in things that put me in front of an audience. Whatever, let, whatever allowed me to feel more comfortable about performing, if you will, I did those kinds of things. So I, I got myself comfortable with speaking or quote unquote performing in public. Um, so I, I, I did a lot of those things just to get me comfortable, you know, with, with that whole notion. Um, now I took, I guess, what we considered typical high school courses at the time. Uh, which have changed, of course, over the decades, and I was, of course, in Canada at the time. But I would focus on the English side of things. Um, I, to me, again, uh, just just you know, the, the ability to speak and write well, to 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 be conversant in 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 the proper grammar rules. To me, writing is just again, I come back to it all the time. Writing and speaking well just means so much in this profession that I I make sure that English and creative writing. Um, are, are things that are you know part of your curriculum and again performance based classes or performance based uh, interests I think should be part of it as well uh, and when you get to college I again here's where I get to kind of a typical path I was a communications major with a broadcast journalism emphasis alright but but times have changed I don't think you need to be that person um, and especially now because you know broadcast journalism means something totally different now than it used to I think broadcast journalism is going to is going to take you in, in so many different areas than it used to. But uh, I don't think that it's necessary that you have that, uh, to be a broadcast journalism major or a communications major to to, to succeed in this business. Um, you know, I I I I would assume, you know, and I've I've taken interns. I, I I hire interns every fall and winter at KSL that get to work with me in my department. You know, and and whether it's political science or English. Or computer science. I'm taking interns with many different interests, not just communications, and they've been great. Um, just as long as they're sharp, as long as they're smart, as long as they're interested in the in, in in the profession, then they're off to a great start. But I would I would just as soon have somebody whose interests are are elsewhere that can then be adapted to this profession um, as much as I'd have somebody that's been classically trained, if you will, you know, in the art of audio and video editing for four straight years. So there's a lot of ways to get around it. Um, and I would say that people don't have to be locked in as they used to be in the communications side. Again, it's helpful. I think it's it's perfectly acceptable 
and sometimes recommended, but I don't think it's imperative like it used to be. When we had talked the other day, you mentioned that uh, now and then you're brought into the business marketing end uh, of activities. Expand a little bit about what that exposure might be like in your role. Yeah, my, my, my official title again is the director of BYU Sports Programming, and as a result, I, I have more responsibility than just the on-air uh, product um, you know, on game day. I'm involved in uh, crafting uh, promotional ideas uh, on-air and in the marketplace, billboards, that kind of thing. And also the uh, sales uh, side of things. Um, you know, we we populate our broadcasts with client commercials, and in order to get those clients, I'm brought in by the sales account executives to accompany them on pitches to help create and craft proposals and kind of help to close deals, if you will. Um, you know, I, I think when an account executive meets with a client, a manager. Um, they had they have one kind of conversation when they bring me into the equation we can have a different kind of conversation because I'm now bringing them into the broadcast booth and explaining in 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 really defined terms how their sponsorship is going to work on air and I think that uh, clients enjoy getting my perspective um, because they feel like they're actually now um, you know working with with the guy that's actually going to get their message out to the public and so that's uh, something that I found is is uh, really helpful. Uh, let's look at a, a couple different angles here. Um, looking back, the most exciting game you called or were involved in? Okay, before I answer that, um, I'm just going to follow up on the question I saw on the side, and I think I kind of addressed it, um, but um, just about co about the corporate advertising. Um, basically, one last thought on that is that. Um, all the account executives are asked to utilize me as much as possible um, and uh, again it, it, as, as frequently as I can get into someone's business um, it just seems like the chances of us securing that clients business are, are that much better than if I'm not involved for whatever reason there's a really strong link there with the broadcaster and it just uh, it's kinda helps again kind of seal the deal a lot of times I found out it's really important uh, if you can get your broadcaster involved in the uh, in the sales side of things, uh, most exciting most exciting games I've called. Um, you know, I, I I think that there there are a handful that kind of jump up and um, in, in the foot and they almost always involve a BYU Utah game for some reason. Um, but the um, the Beck to Harleen game um, in 2006 is usually kind of at the top. I mean, you can't get much better than you know. Being on your rival's home field, needing a touchdown to win with zeros on the clock. I mean, that's that's kind of the dream scenario, and, and that was the play that got called. So um, that that's probably right up there. Um, the Beck to Harleen game. There were some other BYU Utah wins uh, in, in which BYU won. They were pretty exciting. There was an overtime game. Uh, there was the uh, fourth and eighteen to Austin Colley play. Uh, even back in two thousand one. Uh, there was a, a Luke Staley touchdown late in the Utah game uh, there in Gary Croton's first year in Provo that was pretty exciting. So it seems like the BYU-Utah games, the ones that BYU's won, mind you, <laughs> get uh, get pretty close up to the top of the most exciting games I've called. Uh, there have been others, you know, too, but th those those stand out. There were, there were some blocked PATs and blocked field goals to help win games, too. Um, and the Oklahoma game in, in Cowboys State. Stadium was pretty cool, I thought, just because of the venue and how they won that game. That was that was right up there, and then that was a last second touchdown too. That that was that, that was pretty amazing. And in basketball, you know, the Jimmer year was 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 a blast. The senior year, at least, you know, he scored 52 or the half court shot against Utah. A lot of those games, or going back to New York and playing in Glens Falls, those games all kind of jump up. And even back in the early years when Steve Cleveland was getting it going, uh, they qualified for their first NCAA tournament in a long time back in 2001 by winning the conference tournament in Vegas. That was a blast. And even just recently, um, getting to go to New York City two weeks ago for, uh, you know, to go to Madison Square Garden, that, that's, that's a career dream of mine. I mean, I, I, I dreamt of getting to call a game at Madison Square Garden. I never saw, you know, I didn't, I didn't see how it could happen, and it did just a couple of weeks ago. So that was, uh, that, that was another highlight. But there are so many, you know, highlights in games because I've, I've just done hundreds and hundreds of games now, and, and, uh, but there, you know, there, there are a few that come to the top. But you, you took part of my next question away, but we still have football or even basketball. What's left now? Where's the uh, where's the venue you want to call a game in that, that you're you're looking forward someday to having the chance? What's that dream one? Yeah, you know, I, I think I think basketball. Um, 
a place like uh, like Fog Allen Fieldhouse uh, in Lawrence, Kansas. I, I, th I think that's one of those kind of, you know, just historical kind of mythical venues you want to get into. Uh, so I, I, I'd say calling a game at Kansas would be kind of a, a, a maybe like, you know, kind of a last career objective from a basketball standpoint to get into that building. Uh, Hinkle Fieldhouse in, Indi in Indianapolis. I know Butler plays there. and it's, I mean, they don't have the, maybe the history of Kansas, but that's, that's just a great venue. And every, any, anyone who's seen Hoosiers just wants to kind of get in that building and call a game there. So those are two basketball venues. There aren't too many pro venues that I think I want to be in uh, beyond Madison Square Garden. I mean, that's, that's you know, because most of the modern arenas now, I mean, they're, they're, they're amazing. They're palaces. They're glittering. But they don't have necessarily the appeal to get me in there. The one football venue that held that appeal was Cowboy Stadium in Dallas. And I've called two games there now already. So I've kind of already done that one. That's a blast. I mean, Cowboy Stadium, you know, even though, though it is space age and everything else, it is still wild. I mean, it, it's, it's great to call games in there. But from basketball, I'd say probably those two. Because I've, I've been, I, you know, I've called games at uh, Poly Pavilion at UCLA, which is kind of one of those venues you want to get into. That was really cool. And, and in college basketball, there aren't too many of those where you just go, I've got to go. Now, Cameron Indoor at Duke, I have been there uh, in the arena, but not for a game. It would be great to call a game at Cameron Indoor, but I've been in the arena um, uh, so far, and that, that, that was pretty neat. Football, I've hit some pretty good ones, you know. I mean, with, between Notre Dame Stadium and, and uh, the Rose Bowl and, and, and the Coliseum, uh, and even Husky Stadium in Seattle, which I think is one of the great venues in college football. I've been to some really cool ones. Um, there aren't too many I think I need to tick off on that. I think getting to uh, getting to, t uh, to Tennessee Stadium uh, would be great. Uh, Michigan Stadium. Uh, BYU is actually scheduled to play at Michigan, so I'm going to get that one out of the way, I hope. Um, that would that, that, be one I'd like to get to. And, and the Horseshoe in Columbus, uh, Ohio State, I think I'd like to get there as well. When you get to Tennessee, let me know. Actually, one of my former students is director of promotions for the for the Vols down there. Oh yeah, so. no, just 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 being a stadium that 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 big, I think, would blow me away. Uh, Michigan's pretty close, but Neyland Stadium just seems like a a, a blast. What is I'm that like? One hundred and ten or one hundred and twelve thousand something? Yeah, and it's up there now, and and so just being in that kind of size venue would be a uh, would be cool. I did get to call a game at Alabama uh, a few years ago. I was actually on the sidelines at the time, but um, you know that's that's when you, when you get to those SEC stadiums. That's that's where football just kind of feels different, and and the crowds are intense, and the whole weekend's a crazy experience, and so I love calling games in the SEC. Okay, we gave you a shot on the on the positive side. Is there is there ever been a uh, a game that you care to share that you just wish it didn't happen, and you didn't have to announce it, and you 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 could have avoided the whole situation, kind of that that worst case scenario? Uh, well. Only, only in relation to the end result. Just, result. it's just the hardest losses for BYU. You know, I mean, and and again, it always goes back to the BYU Utah games. I mean, it seems like when 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 BYU wins, they win on like a last second miracle. When Utah wins, they either crush you or they or they also win on on a late you know last second type situation. And so you know, I, I would say you know there there are some of those Utah games that that, that come to mind. Um, you know, whether it's a made field goal. In, in, in Provo years and years ago for one of those 34-31 games, or it's a blocked BYU field goal just a few years ago in, in, uh, in 2010. Um, you know, the ones where the rival beats the rival in the most crushing way possible, those ones hurt. Or, or both times that, that, that Utah kind of capped off its BCS seasons by, by killing BYU. Um, you know, those ones, I mean, that, that's where you know what's going to happen, but it's still, I mean... You know they know that by beating BYU they've clinched their BCS thing and 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 so those ones are hard too. So it almost always comes back to BYU Utah somehow. I know there there have probably been a handful of other games that 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 probably sting, but you know the way things go in this state that that game means so much. Um, you know because because BYU hasn't been in a position lately where like where they you know need a win you know to make the BCS or need a win to to win. A huge bowl game, um, you know. They, they just haven't been in that kind of situation lately. But Utah has, but it, but you know. So I, I would say it's the, it's it's those games that come to mind. Um, I was trying to think, you know, a few years ago, BYU opened six and zero, I think, and and people thought maybe this is their BCS year. They went to TCU and got smoked, you know. And, and even then, they were getting smoked, and so you didn't feel like you didn't feel like your heart was torn out. You just felt like you weren't as good a team and you were going to get exposed at some point anyway. And sure enough, they, they, they went on and lost three times, I think, that year. So 
Again, I, I don't have too many of those just pure heartbreakers in football. Now, basketball is kind of different. Basketball, you do remember certain games where you just, you know, I mean, you know, this year's St. Mary's game, that that that, that Matthew Della Vadova game is, I don't recall feeling that way after too many games. I mean, I, that, that that just ripped your heart out. You know, BYU was 14-4. and four. They were on a pretty good roll. They needed that win to kind of boost their resume, and they had that game won. I mean, Tyler Hawes is the shot with two and a half seconds to go. You've won that game, and two seconds later, you've lost that game. And I, I was I, I was like speechless for ten seconds. Um, it, it, that, that was that tough a loss, and I, I think it kind of gutted BYU too. Um, they went seven and seven over their next fourteen games after that shot. It was a hard one to come back from. So there are games like that that do kind of stick with you. Back in the day, when I was younger, and I was doing sidelines for Paul James um, on the radio, I, I'd be a lot more affected by by losses, I, I think, you know, than I am now. Now they kind of roll off a little more, but there are still those times when you just go, oh, man, if only, if they could just only have done this or done that. Um, so I see a question here about what tricks I use to try to keep audiences engaged in blowouts. And, um, you know... It's as challenging for a broadcaster as, as it is for, for an audience member to, to stay invested in those blowouts. Um, and I think, you know, it, it's a little easier in radio than it is in TV because in TV you have to have kind of additional material to fill, you know, when the game's not interesting anymore. But in, in radio, you've always got a job to do. You've got to describe the play. I mean, whether a team is leading big or trailing big, your job remains the same. They can't see the action, so you get to describe it for them. So you're not trying to fill. You've still got your job to do. And so as long as you can still, um, you know, do your job properly, you've given the audience a reason to listen. Now, the color analyst has a bit of a bit tougher job, you know, in helping to, um, again, maybe find, you know, fill in the, the, the blanks and the cracks where, where the action's taken us a different direction. But I, I think that also is a credit to chemistry. If you've got good chemistry with your broadcast partners, um, the audience will enjoy listening to you even if the game isn't necessarily as compelling. Um, you know, sometimes you can listen for the broadcast. You can listen for the broadcasters. You can listen for the chemistry they've got. And, and so that's, that, 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 that's also motivation to, to constantly improve your craft and, and work for good chemistry between you and your partners. A little outside of, of your particular role, but how do you think the diminished uh, role of the rivalry between BYU and Utah is going to affect sports in the state long term. I mean, it, there's all kinds of discussion, but the bottom line is it doesn't look like football is going to necessarily continue on, and obviously basketball uh, with less or fewer games. What do you think? Well, um, football's heading for a two-year hiatus. I have no reason to believe that it will be longer than that, and that, that there's a game scheduled for uh, 2016, I think. Uh, I'm not sure if the contract's formal or not, but... I mean, I, I would hope it's only a hiatus. I don't, I don't, I don't see the reason for it. I, 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 don't, I just don't see why it had to happen. I mean, I, I, I think that's all on Utah, and I don't, th I don't think they can justify that based on what they did. They replaced BYU with Fresno State. You know, and I, I just don't see, you know, why you had to drop BYU if that was what they came out of it with. So, again, I, I, th I, th I think the reason for dropping it is faulty to begin with, uh, but it should pick up as soon as possible. And I, I think continue. I think that's an important game. I think both sides can acknowledge it's an important game. I don't think that, that Utah fans um, like the trade-off. I don't think they say, well, we lost BYU for two years, but at least we got Fresno State. Um, that, that, that's, that's not a fair trade-off. And so the way they did it, I, I think, was flawed. Um, and it just proved to me there's no reason to drop it. There's no reason to drop that game. So keep that game. I think it's important for both teams, even if it's played in September. It's still an important game. Uh, basketball, yeah, one a year gives you a different feel, but as, but as soon as you were not in the same conference, it just automatically had a different feel. I mean, as soon as Utah and BYU split, things changed. They just did change, and that's I'm not going to say it's unfortunate because it's a fact of life that 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 you know BYU was not going with Utah to the Pac-12. That was not happening. So once that once that happened, you know things did change. Uh, but as much as you can hang on to as possible, let's try and do that, which is keep that football game on an annual basis. Um, I, think it's, I think it's just a fun game to have. Um, I, 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 I don't get too wound up in the, in the camp that says that, you know, things had gotten too intense or it was over the line. Um, to me, it was just a good rivalry and, and a highlight of the season. So 
I would have preferred they kept it, and hopefully they do keep it after this two-year break. Well, Greg, I want to thank you for taking the time today to talk to us and uh, visit us in the classroom. We appreciate it. Um, I know I appreciate it be, uh, big time because for a lot of the years, I, I didn't have access on TV, but I could always stream or get the radio in, so I listened to you call a lot of games, and, and I do enjoy the enthusiasm. I think that if, if you're the, the, the voice for the home team, you're not a little bit of a, quote, homer, unquote, then, then you're uh, not doing your job. So we appreciate that and, and all that you've done for us today. Well, it's been fun. It's my first ever uh, Google Plus Hangout, so you got me introduced to the whole uh, medium here, so that was good. Um, and uh, to the guys and girls in the class, uh, have a great rest of the day and a good weekend, and uh, hope you stayed awake, and um, maybe we'll do this again sometime. All right. Thanks a lot, Greg. Take care. Thank you. Okay, see ya.